hello and welcome to an Everyday Canines video. This episode I am looking at the basics of the seesaw. So first things to think about when I'm talking about this item, it's known as one of the contact pieces of equipment or contact equipment or sometimes they just get called contacts. What that means is it refers to the A-frame, the dog walk and the seesaw and it means they have this area on which is a contact area. They have one at the beginning, one at the end. And the contact is the dog has to make contact with this section. And usually that section at the bottom as well. So they have to make contact bottom and top to complete the obstacle correctly. So when we're talking about contact equipment, we're referring to the three pieces that have these contact areas. Seesaw, A-frame, dog walk. Another thing to mention, because you may be watching this in a different country, is in other countries this is known as the teeter. We're in the UK, so we call it the seesaw, because that is what we've always called it, it's what we consider a seesaw, but it can be called a teeter. Now, you will notice that mine is made of wood. There's a very practical reason for that, because it's out in all elements, out exposed in the field, and I wanted something a bit heavy duty. Years ago, all seesaws, you'd, you'd come across all your seesaws being made of wood. And that's a quite a heavy material for a seesaw. These days, it would be unusual to go to a competition and find a seesaw that was not made of aluminium. Certainly, in a kennel club competition, I would not expect to come across uh, any seesaw that wasn't aluminium. Though, to be fair, I have, on some very small shows, I have come across that. But in general, because these places hire in their equipment, you would expect your seesaw to be aluminium. Aluminium is lighter, so in terms of how, it, uh, how the seesaw behaves when it's made of aluminium, it moves a lot easier because it's a lighter material. It takes much less force for the dog to make it move. It makes a different noise when it lands. So wood is quite a soft sound, so if we listen to this bit, if we listen... It's a softish sound. An aluminium seesaw is quite a hard bang, especially on um, a sand surface. I would recommend if you were considering training up to a competition level, and you know, I've made homemade this seesaw. So you might have a homemade seesaw yourself like this. I would certainly suggest that you go somewhere either that you can hire equipment so that you can practice on a aluminium seesaw as well as a wooden one, or you know, you might want to invest in an aluminium seesaw they're not that expensive you know relatively but you know you might want to do that or you might be at a club that has aluminium contacts but certainly at some point though you can obviously make a homemade seesaw for yourself and homemade seesaw is absolutely fine out of wood you probably want at some point to spend some time on an aluminium seesaw because your dog will notice the difference it applies to all your contacts actually a frame and dog walk but certainly the seesaw your dog will notice the difference I actually remember when we first changed over from everything being wooden seesaws to them now saying, right, we're going to aluminium seesaws. I can remember my older dog who had never been on aluminium. First time he went on an aluminium seesaw at club, he went, oh my word, this is different. He just stood there going, whoa, this is weird. It's different. So it's just something to bear in mind. But certainly for home training, and especially when it's outside like this, so it's in all elements, the wood is absolutely fine. It's nice and solid. It doesn't get blown over. Aluminium does get blown over. And it's, you know, it's substantial. So this is a substantial seesaw. At the same time, it, it does conform to the specifications it should. So if we look at the specifications for what they should be, our plank should be 3.66 metres in length. In old money, that's 12 foot. So all these um, specifications, they come from, they're originally in feet, so they've just converted them. So that is the same length, I believe, as a dog walk plank. The width for the plank, which is this width, so across here, between 25.4 centimetres and 30.5 centimetres. I would suggest when you're making something like this, I would always go to the, the widest it can be, because I think that's better for the dog. 25.4, I actually looked at that, that's very narrow. So I would, I would certainly, I think you'll find that most seesaws are made to be at the, the maximum they can be. So this is the bit where it gets slightly complicated. 
the central bracket, which is this section, where my seesaw, hello gorgeous, where my seesaw is pivoting from. We're actually looking at the top of this section and it's got to be between 610 millimetres and 685 millimetres. When we first made this, we actually did the lower height on it and it looked really wrong. And I realised that in competition, the majority of time you get competition, you get the full height, which is 685. And um, though you can have it lower, and actually they can put them lower, you know, the competition ones are adjustable, you will find the majority are set at the highest height. So I would suggest going for the highest height. If you want to, you can obviously have make an adjustable seat. So mine isn't, it's just one set height. And lastly, our contact area. So our contact area is 91.4 centimetres at the end of the plank. So that's the, the this is 91.4 centimetres and it always goes right to the end. And you have it in contrasting colours so you can see it. I don't so suppose so much that I don't think the dogs particularly can see that it's a contact area, if I'm honest with you. Because of the way dogs see colours and I, because of the way dog is coming, I really don't think that dogs spend that much time thinking about what the colour of the contact is. Um, though you might find that sometimes I've had target mats on of a certain colour and that does seem to help them. But in general, it's more for us. So we can see that the dog is making contact with these areas or should I say the judge because obviously he, they're the ones that are going to be deciding if you've done the obstacle correctly or not. Talking about the top surface, this is rubber and it would be unusual to find anything other than rubber these days. In the old days we used to have um, what they call sanded surfaces or painted sand. So you used to put sand in paint and they used to be, give a slight grip and you'd have slats. You don't do that nowadays. The rubber is far better. It's nice and substantial to keep giving dogs plenty of grip. Also you don't have slats on a seesaw anymore. They could be an issue um, catching toes and stuff like that. They're not necessary, not with this rubber. The dog can hold on nicely and ride it nicely without that necessary. One of the things to bear in mind, and I must admit, having looked at my seesaw today, it's something I'm gonna to have to work on because it isn't quite right, is the counterbalancing. Now, obviously you've got the pivot in the point in the middle, so you've got to counterbalance your seesaw so that one end not only stays down, but when the dog has finished the seesaw, the seesaw should return itself to that position. So that can take a little bit of tweaking. Now, when the dog comes up, it says in the Kennel Club specifications that when they reach this point, it sh the seesaw should tip in two to three seconds. And what we're looking at as a test, we need to get an item that weighs a kilo. And the item that weighs a kilo should sit here and the seesaw should lower between two to three seconds. So this is about, this is a, a litre of water, which is roughly a kilo. And we noticed today when we came out here and we read the specs and we thought that, that when I put my bottle there, my seesaw does not move at all. It needs a little bit more, spare, just mind your bum, to actually get it to go down. So that's just something to bear in mind because it is something that will be important in competition. The reason these things are important is first of all safety. If you're thinking about it, you've got a little lightweight dog. I mean, some dogs can be only a kilo or just over a kilo. If you're talking about some of these really tiny dogs, chihuahuas and things, they compete. Little papillons, they might not weigh too much. They've got to come out here and the seesaw has got to tip just as if they're a border collie. It's got to tip in a reasonable time to make it fair, which is why they're saying two to three seconds. So we don't want it going down too fast to fling our dogs off but we want it to go down in a reasonable time reasonable amount of time when the dog hits a certain point similarly are we coming to do it are we very nice thank you similarly we we want the the seesaw to be pivoting at a set point we don't want it pivoting too soon so that it's going down before the dog has a chance to reach the end and we don't want it going down so slow that dog sits there for half an hour waiting for it to go down which can actually cause some dogs to worry and jump off so that's a thing to bear in mind I should also point out that nearly all seesaws are different weights I, I it's it's very very 
inconsistent when you find your seesaws weighted. Um, recently, I think the Kennel Club are trying to make a difference on that and make them more even, but you go from one show to the next, and I can tell you with little dogs, sometimes they get to a show and the dog gets on the contact, and I think, crikey, that's taking a long time to go down, and other times it goes down really quick. So it is one of those things that, as part of the training process, is you've got to help them to understand that, yes, this might take longer than other times to go down, but you, you hold your position or whatever you're asking them to do. In training terms, seesaws are actually one of the hardest things to train because of the confidence issue. One of the things I want to mention is that you always should have a reasonably straight entry onto the seesaw, or straightish. You can have a slight curve, so it could be a very loose curve as long as the dog can get onto the seesaw straight. You wouldn't have them turning from here, say, and coming onto the seesaw, at least in the UK. I have seen that in some other countries, but not in the UK, because this would not be considered a straight entry. That's partly because this is a narrow plank and it prevents the dog from throwing itself straight off because sometimes if a dog is going fast and they hit at an angle, they just haven't got, they can't switch enough to get up. So they throw themselves off. But the other thing is, you need a certain degree of momentum and speed to get power up this seesaw and drop it. And if you haven't got a straight line, you can't get that. So that's when your dog needs to be able to go in a straight line to power up this seesaw, to have enough momentum that they're nearly here by the time it tips. Because what we don't want is we don't want our dog getting here and they're slow and oh it's starting to tip slow 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 we don't want that we want our dog to power as far up as possible and tip it from there so those are your basics on the design of the seesaw i should also mention that the base is nice and heavy duty weighted we don't want it flipping around too much sandbags are used to weight a base now if you watch my seesaw I haven't got any sandbags on it you will notice that the base flicks up a little bit when this reverts in position and it reverts hard the back end will flick up a little bit in competition you would expect to see sandbags or pegging to prevent that however I have also seen it where there's not so because I want my dogs to appreciate that can happen I have deliberately not put sandbags but to be utterly correct this should be weighted down so the base cannot move at all but those are your seesaw basics on the construction, what they're made of, and we'll talk a bit more about safety factors with the seesaw later on, but those are your basics. I hope you've enjoyed this Everyday Canines video, and if you have, you might subscribe to the YouTube channel, and you can check us out on Facebook and Instagram. And I hope to see you all again very, very soon.